course, yeah, like, hey, everybody, happy new year and some stuff. There you go. Yeah. It, uh, it is the beginning of a new year. Uh, it just so happens that uh, today, Sunday, happens to be the first day. And so why not capitalize on that somehow or another? We are going to have a New Year's sermon. So I thought very hard about just going directly into a book and preaching on this. But uh, no, it, it's the New Year's. Let's go ahead and do a topical one about the New Year. Let's go ahead and do that. We have a God who is a, mm, I want to say a planner. We have a God who is a planner, but he's not only a planner, he's, um, because that makes it sound almost like he had to, I don't know, fabricate some notion and then sort of consider it and then bring in the variables and then, but uh, it's more than that. He's, He's a God who, yeah, I think planning is an okay word to use there, but he's also a God who brings about. He's a God who... Uh, is instrumental in being causally related to many of the things that show up in life. Uh, The reason why I say many is because I really want to be careful about uh, implicating God in all of evil. Our God is not the author of evil. Our God is not the author of wickedness. Our God is... Sometimes we get these models of God being in charge and being omnipotent and being in control of everything. And so, therefore, when people go to hell, it's because God did that. Um, so I want to be really careful about, you know, painting God in this sort of light that he's in control of everything to the point that you don't have any agency or that you don't have an actual mind or that you don't have an actual heart or soul or any of those things. But God is causally related and bringing things about. But, hey, good news, you can be a, not can be, you are whether you want to be or not, a participant in what it is that God is doing. God will not be you for you, right? And I I think that that's a good thing. I think that that's a wonderful thing because he wants to have a relationship with an actual you, not just some sort of, um, yeah, weird clone that's sort of set in robotic lockstep or something along those lines. He wants to have a real relationship with a real you, and he has really taken Uh, many, many, many steps to set things up to be to your benefit so that you and your God can come together and have a marvelous relationship. Now, it doesn't mean that everything in life is always going to go wonderfully. Sometimes we look at life and we think, um, maybe I'm the only one, maybe I'm the only one, but I sort of doubt it. We sort of get this idea that I don't know, for lack of a better term, God is some kind of like celestial CEO whose job it is, is to make sure that everybody's having a good time. And then if we aren't having a good time, somehow things have gotten out of hand and maybe God has like dropped the ball somewhere or something like that. Uh, Maybe you have not had that experience, but I've had the experience where things are not going the way that I thought. And I go, where's God? Where's God? It is not the case that God has at, at all left or that he is any less powerful or anything like that. It's just that, uh, you know, it's not going the way that I want it to go. Well, all those things are potential, aren't they? We've got this new year in front of us. We've got an old year behind us, and we've got a few years behind them. And we can kind of look at those and see a pattern and say, I bet something goes wrong this year. <laughs> right? Somewhere along the lines, I bet something goes wrong this year. However, with that, if you don't get anything else out of today's sermon, I want to point to a God who is faithful. You can know what is in the future because you know what's in the past. You have seen God be faithful. That will not stop. That will not change. God will continue to be faithful as we go into uh, the new year. So maybe you have some things looming would be a good word here. Maybe you have some things looming over the top of you, and it looks a little desperate in some cases. Well, I have good news. God is faithful, and he is not about to stop being faithful. And all the powers of darkness tremble at what they just heard, because all the powers of darkness can't undo a single word. God is faithful and will continue to be faithful. So, Let's pray, and let's get into our text. Our Father, we thank you. We thank you in advance. Uh, We know that this is some sort of just, I guess, uh, arbitrary line uh, carved onto a calendar. Uh, But, Lord, we uh, just take an an opportunity to commemorate uh, the significance of a, quote-unquote, new year, a new opportunity, a fresh 
new uh, place to begin, a place where we can draw our line in the sand and, and make a fresh attempt where we can start anew, but where we will meet you already in process of faithfulness. Thank you in advance for the faithfulnesses that you will demonstrate, for the compassions that you will continue to show, for the generosity that you will continue to give with. Thank you, God, that what you have done is not disrupted by uh, something that we are doing or, or even will do, that you are powerful and that you, you will bring about change, that you, you are powerful and you will bring about good, that you are powerful, but that your power is also metered out in love and in grace. Thank you, God, that you are powerful. And thank you, God, that you are he who loves us, he who even cherishes us and pursues us. Thank you, God. Thank you that you have set for yourself uh, a way and that it is forward and that it is towards you. Help us to take hold of that as an opportunity and to draw close to you in the coming year and even just now. We pray it in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, so um, if we go to the book of Genesis, we're going to see. Da, 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 da. I can see I brought my cheaters, and it's actually amazing how much this changes. Like, there are now words. That's great. Uh, let's go to the book of Genesis. We're going to go to page one of the Bible. Let's go to Genesis, and we're going to read uh, a little bit right here at the beginning. So, Genesis chapter one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We're already answering the question of who before we even get into the what. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day. Then God continues as he had begun, and we see that there's a development of where God continues to create. God continues to put in order God continues to separate out and cause distinction, one thing from another, and then uh, unite things in meaningful, operative ways. And so go to uh, chapter 1, verse um, 14. God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens, to give light on the earth. And it was so God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. You may recall that as being a, a text of a sermon that's on its own. Um, God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give lights on the earth, and to govern the day and the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. Okay, so there are a whole bunch of things going on here um, that uh, I'm going to just glance over the top of a lot of different events that we have in front of us. We have what's called a solar calendar. There are 365.24 days that it takes for the earth and sun to do their little dance and to bring about what we call a year. And so because of the math on that, then it's not quite a quarter, 365.25. Uh, it's not quite a quarter, it's 0.24. So because of this, every four years we have a leap year and all that. And then um, every once in a while we actually uh, have a, an, a leap day added on to a non-leap year year where it's, it doesn't matter. Calendar, solar, it's amazing. Wow, the mathematics involved, great, fantastic. And it's in this sort of set pattern that we can count on. Well, the Jewish calendar, it operated a little bit different. It was on a lunar calendar. The lunar calendar is also really pretty fascinating. It is like 28 days for the moon to do what the moon does. And so because of this, every culture, 
not just the Jews and certainly not just the Americans, but everybody recognizes that there are seven day weeks. It's pretty weird. There are actually like, I think a couple of cultures where they did it the other way around where they had four day weeks and they had seven of them in a month. Bizarre, right? But anyhow, the seven and the four quality remains. Uh, most of us know that there is a seven day week and that you get four of those in a lunar month. Um, so the Jews were told here that they would be given these lamps up in the sky and that they would be there as a calendar. It's a calendar. It's a gigantic watch. You get to, have you ever seen the face of a watch taken off and you get to see how the intricate bits and pieces, not a digital one, you can't, a mechanical one, the analog face, you know, or a, a grandfather clock where the face has been removed and you get to see the gears and the cogs and the springs and the swings and all the things. That rhymed, I didn't even mean for it to. Uh, the, uh, the, the point of that is, is that we are living in the midst of the cogs. We are living in this place where we can see the sun and the moon and their perceived rotations and where the planets go in orbit and all these things. And there is a calendar that is put in place for us. And according to that calendar that's put, been put in place, we have what we think of as years. We don't just have a random series of this event followed by that event. We actually have calendars. We actually have uh, the way that we chart events. We have weeks, we have months, we have years because of the way that we are living inside of a calendric clock called the universe. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating, I think. Okay. But with that comes, as uh, God speaks to the Jews, with this lunar calendar comes uh, here, uh, he says, I am giving you these lamps, I'm giving you the sun and the moon and the stars because they're going to work as a calendar for you, which is going to be very, very important because the Jews, in order to be faithful people, are going to have to observe things like Sabbath. They're going to have to observe Passover. They're going to have to observe Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, the, the new year. We're in new year right now, but not Rosh Hashanah. It's on a different calendar, remember. Anyhow, and also Yom Kippur. So the calendar, the very fact that God set things up in such a way that this is going to rotate this way, this is going to turn that way, this is going to orbit this way, and the mathematics and all that goes with that set up for a calendar. The calendar is there because we're going to put onto the calendar celebration days. We're going to put onto this calendar times of commemoration and of remembrance. And what is it that you're supposed to commemorate? What is it you're supposed to remember? We're not going to go through all of the feast days, but the ones that I named, um, we of course have Sabbath, uh, which that means seventh. So Sabbath is literally Saturday, the seventh day, um, but we get together on the first day because it's called the Lord's Day in the book of Acts. It's when uh, we commemorate the Lord uh, rising from the dead. Uh, so we meet on Sundays instead of on Saturdays, plus the fact that we're not under the law. We're not under the law. We're not under the law. Praise the Lord. We're not under the law. Because we have other things that show up. Passover. Passover is the celebration of the redemption of God's people and of freedom. You guys remember that when the whole painting of the blood on the lentils and all of that and everybody leaves Egypt and the bad guys all die and the good guys yay for us. And here we go out into freedom and it's because they've been redeemed. So this calendric value of the solar system and the universe is put there in order for the Jews to be able to mark not only new things that God is doing, like Passover, breaking people out of slavery, breaking people out of bondage, bringing people into freedom, taking people into the promises of the promised land, but that, that nature of how the universe is ordered is there in order to be able to cyclically, once a year, come back to it and have Passover year by year by year, or Rosh Hashanah, which is the celebration of new beginnings. Rosh Hashanah is the new year. Rosh, uh, you guys don't care. Um, so, and then uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Once a year, there would be that day where the high priest would go in and he would make atonement at one meant. 
there would be reconciliation. We have the universe is ordered in such a way as to remind us of not only these feasts, but more feasts, not only these celebrations, more celebrations, marking what it is that God has done and giving indicators of what it is that God will do, because you will know that these festivals are actually prophetic as well, because they mark the coming of the one who would be our Passover, the one who would be the head, who would bring about that new beginning, the one who would bring about true atonement and true uh, reconciliation. And that means that you can be reminded day by day and night by night as you watch the universe do its dance, that God put that dance there in order to be a reminder, in order to be able to mechanically watch When's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? The ball drops. It's Rosh Hashanah, everybody. You know, we, we get to watch as these things come into their, their point of remembrance. Okay. More things. He put the uh, sun in place, not just the moon. The moon is the Jewish calendar, um, which is really important for marking how things lay out. But he also gave us the sun. Genesis chapter 1, verse 16. And that's really important because you'll notice that from the outset. It was the third day. Okay, I, I get it. But on the third day, he put in place uh, certain features of the universe that are going to show up again. One of the places that the sun shows up in its strength as a, I'll call it a literary device, but I don't mean to say that this is fiction at all. Joshua, in the book of Joshua chapter 10, verses 12 and the, the next verse, Joshua is taking the people into the promised land, and they're fighting against the Amorites, and the Amorites don't really feel like letting the Jews have their land. So they, you know, are fighting against them, and it, it makes sense to me. Uh, but the, um, the story that is given is that Joshua sees that the victory is theirs. The victory is theirs. And he says, let the sun stand still until we have routed the enemy and then we will have victory and we will fulfill what it is that we've come in here to do. So the, um, the sun stands still. The sun stops in its place. Phenomenological language or otherwise, the sun is at minimum perceived as standing still until, oh, by the way, I have no problem, uh, even as a scientist, I have no problem with the sun stopping and it got, okay? There you go. So, uh, but um, the, the idea is that at minimum, perceptually, the sun stands still and they win the victory. So there's the sun is outside right now. When you leave, I want you to look up and don't, don't look at the sun and get cataracts or burn your retinas. That's not what I mean to say here. But look at the sun and realize that when you see the sun, the sun is a reminder that the victory is ours. The sun is doing its thing and it doesn't have to stop because the victory is ours. I want you to also know that the sun should be a reminder that you can't stop us. You can stop the sun, but you can't stop us. The victory is ours. You can stop the sun, you can't stop us. The victory has been given to us. We win. We win. Then there are more things. The stars. We just got done celebrating Christmas. Do you guys remember how in the book of Matthew, the wise guys, they was looking at the stars up there and they say, hey, there's a new star. Look at that guy. And they follow this star, and they find the newborn king. The stars also are rem reminders for us of this work that God has set in place from the beginning, from the outset. And he tells us in advance, hey, you guys, page one, I'm going to do stuff. Watch. The stars are going to... This is not Zodiac stuff. Don't get into the Zodiac stuff, because that's... That's not what we're talking about, okay? It just isn't. Be careful. You, you don't want to get into the occult. Um, yeah, you've been warned. So, but um, the Lord does tell us that he is doing things and that he will telegraph his message and that he will give to us this, um, that there will be, that the sun and the moon and the stars will work in such a way as to indicate that God is doing things. He's up to stuff. 
And one of the times where we see that is, in fact, in Jesus' coming. And the wise men see the star and are they take hold of Genesis chapter 1, verse 16. The stars are there. The stars are indicating something. And then they are moved to come and worship, bow down before the newborn king. Um, yeah, light and dark, which we saw in Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, the whole light and dark thing. Let's go to Exodus chapter 10 and look at verses 21 through 23. You guys remember that in the uh, book of Exodus, God uh, sets his victory up by having a series of victories. We call them the plagues. They're the 10 plagues uh, in Egypt. The ninth of these victories where um, Ra, the god of Egypt, Ra, the sun god, sometimes it's pronounced Re, but um, the sun god Ra is now being taken to task. Each of the 10 plagues is one of the Egyptian gods being kicked in the pants, right? Oh, you got a god, do you? Well, let's kick him in the pants. So, you know, the plague number nine is where there's darkness and, um, you know, well, where's the sun now? He's apparently my minor emissary, says God, and he does what I want him to do. There is darkness uh, here. So verses 21 through 23, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even a darkness, darkness which may be felt. Did you notice that God used human agency to bring that one about? He tells Moses, hey, Moses, you wave your hand. There are things that God is doing that he will not do apart from human agency. He has imbued and endued us with a certain rulership and a certain power where we get to participate with him, and he's going to have us do certain things. You do this, maybe it doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense. I'm going to do something marvelous out of it, though. Verse 22, so Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days, but all the sons of Israel had light in their dwellings. <laughs> okay, so from the outset, we see that God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. This is something that God did from the outset, and it's something that shows up again day by day by day by day, but sometimes God brings about this separation of light and darkness in new, fresh, exciting, invigorating, empowering kind of ways. Uh, with the darkness, he shines the light. And he made it that way from the beginning, right? Here's the story as given from page one, and he has already given to us the Legos that he's going to build everything else out of, right? That doesn't mean he's not going to do fresh, new, exciting, invigorating, crazy, amazing things, but it does mean that he has already set it up. The deists, you guys know who the deists are? Um, like uh, the, it was a movement quite a long while ago where people believed in God. They even believed in the God of the Bible, but they didn't believe in an interventionist God, a God who would reach in from the outside and sort of tinker with things. They more regarded God as being the one who made the wind-up clock, and he wound up the wind-up clock, and then he set the wind-up clock aside and let the universe do what the universe does. He set it up to do what it does. Well, I, we cannot go to that extreme. Okay, but I can see why they came to those conclusions, because on page one, we have what appear to be all of the mechanics for all of the things that he's going to bring about in the future. But we do have a God who is not on the outside sort of fiddling about with things on the inside. We have a God who is actually joined with us in the mix. It is not the case that he is a God far off. He is a God who is in the midst. And we just celebrated the Emmanuel, Lord. God is with us, Lord. He's not a God who is far off. He is, however, a God who did set things up from the outset. 
did intelligently put things in place. He has things designed. He has things engineered. And now what he has to do is simply make use of what it is that he has already put into place. He is an intelligent God, and he, he uh, includes us in his doings. Go uh, to Genesis chapter 1, verse 20. Then God said, Let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. Okay, so then go to from there, 1 Kings. Bible drill. You guys with me? Uh, 1 Kings chapter 17. Bible's the number one selling bestseller book in the whole best-selling book world. You should know how to operate the thing, right? Okay, so uh, chapter 17 and starting at verse 2. The word of the Lord came to him, that is Elijah, because Elijah picked a fight. The word of the Lord came to him saying, Go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. It shall be that you will drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to provide for you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and lived by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he would drink from the brook. Okay, the point of my bringing up uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 20 is we see that God has established that there would be birds. He put the birds in place, and they're not just a decoration. They actually have a utility. They actually have a place in God's economy. And God knew in advance that these birds would lay eggs, which would hatch and become these birds, which would lay eggs, which would hatch and become these birds, which would, and on down the line until one day, God would make use of what he had set in place. And there would be birds of all things. There would be birds that would deliver to Elijah, his prophet. He says, hey, Elijah, I need you to go over here. And I need you to be in this place. And I'm going to provide for you. So when you see birds, maybe even ravens, but when you see birds... I want you to be reminded that God has set things up in such a way that you will be provided for. You are walking down the road and you see a bird. And in that bird, you are given a reminder. Oh yeah, I have the God of providence, the God who will provide. Oh yeah, I have the God who, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, things that we could say to go down that same line. But God makes provision, and one of the provisions is that he made birds. They now serve, if you have eyes to see it, they serve not only as being delicious, um, because some birds are. Um, so this is where you've got to be careful, because he, uh, if he had sent chickens, he may have said, I'm going to send you a, a you know, chicken dinner or something like that, and then they would have brought him corn, because that's what chickens eat. Instead... Uh, he brought him a raven dinner, which is bread and, and meat. Um, but, uh, like, take note of this. God, all the way back here, made these little meat machines that would do his will and do his bidding, and they flap and they fly, and they go and they retrieve bread and meat on this special occasion and bring it to Elijah right where God sent him, and they provide for him. So when you see birds, when you see birds, be reminded that we serve the God who provides. And he has given to us now, as I said, if you have eyes to see it, in birds, you have a reminder of God's faithfulness. Okay. Um, the same verse, Genesis chapter 1, verse 20, God also made fish, the swarming things in the water. He made fish. Okay, so uh, go to Matthew chapter 17. I want you to see this. The book of Matthew chapter 17, where Peter, I love Peter, he's, he's a mensch, he's a mensch, Peter, that guy, um, he's um, a little bit of a lovable idiot in some ways, uh, Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, uh, let's see, go to verse 24, 
When they came to Capernaum, those who collect the two drachma tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the two drachma tax? He said, Yes. Like that's what he said. Uh, and when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first before Peter had a chance to say anything, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth collect customs or poll taxes? From their sons or from strangers? When Peter said, From strangers? Jesus said to him, Then the sons are exempt. However, so that we do not offend them, go to the sea and throw in a hook, not a bunch of hooks, throw in a hook and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for you and for me. Uh, awesome. Awesome. Okay, so we've already talked about how God is the God who provides. Okay, but I want to kind of develop that just a little bit with this fish. God makes fish. God already knew from the outset what he was going to do. And here's this fish that he has already set up for Peter to come discover. So not only does God provide, do please know that, but this is, okay, you've run your mouth. You've kind of backed yourself into a little bit of a corner. You maybe shouldn't have committed yourself to saying what it was that you sort of committed yourself to saying, and now you don't know what you're going to do. But God, in the person of Christ, says, before you have an opportunity to even confess, hey, uh, Jesus, I sort of talked myself into a corner over here. So before you have the opportunity to even explain yourself, God says, I've already got it covered. I've already got it covered. And uh, maybe one or two of you can identify with this. You've sort of talked yourself into a corner. You sort of spoke a little earlier than you should have. You sort of said something that, and then Jesus says to you, hey, uh, it's just so that you know, is it the sons or is it the, uh, the foreigners that you wind up collecting tax? So then we should be exempt, right, Pete? Right, Pete? Right, Pete? Okay, but so that we don't cause any offense, go throw in just one hook and just pull up the first thing that, and go ahead and take that coin and pay for both you and me. God, not only does he provide our needs, he also is concerned for those places where we step on our own toes. Praise God. Let fish be a reminder to you that God has provided even for when we are, you know, not all that swift. And he's made a way for us, okay? But he had things set up in order all the way from the beginning. All right. The beasts, Genesis chapter 1, verses 24 through 25. Um, and as you know, the beasts, um, they are made out of the ground. Uh, let the earth bring forth living creatures. And uh, after, after their kind, keep that in mind, after their kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind and the cattle after their kind and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind, and God saw that it was good. So um, when you get to Matthew chapters, uh, chapter 21, verses 2 through 7, what you see there is that Jesus is going to be riding in to uh, Jerusalem on a donkey. Uh, Matthew chapter 21, verses 2 through 7, he's going to ride in on a uh, donkey, and it says, uh, go into the village opposite you, and you're going to find a colt there, untie uh, the donkey and the colt, and bring them to me, and if anybody asks you anything, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately, doesn't this have the feel of already being set up? Like God kind of already knew what was going to happen, like Jesus had things already prearranged, it's already okay. If anybody asks you anything, then just say the Lord has need of it, and then immediately uh, he'll send them with you. This took place, by the way, to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. So I want you to see the acrobatics that are going on here prophetically. God created way back here on page one. He made the beasts who would breed and who would have after their own kind. And then uh, there's a point at which Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, prophesies and says, hey, by the way, the beasts 
of the field, the donkey, there's going to be a one who's going to come in and he's going to be riding this donkey into Jerusalem. So we even have it prophesied as well. And now here comes Jesus who says, just go over there and get for us the donkey that I have in mind and don't worry, it'll be okay. And just go ahead and use these words and say, the Lord has need of it and everything's gonna fall into place just as he needs to. There's even prophecies on top of God's set up uh, prearranged, engineered work. In Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 through 10, uh, we are made to, to be aware. He reminds us that um, God knows all the things that he intends to do. So Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10 go this way. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. What does he give to us to help us have security about the things in the future? memory. The way that he, in, in the, what he said is, remember, remember the former things. Why? Because he's God. And because he declares the end from the beginning and his purposes will be established and he will accomplish all that is his good pleasure. You don't have to be a prophet to know what's going to happen in the future. You have to look at the past, be a student of history. God has been good. God will be good. God has been faithful. God will be faithful. God has provided. God will provide. God has protected. God will protect. God has gotten me out of many scrapes where I got myself into a problem and thank God because that's going to happen again. And the Lord will show up again, and he will get me out of the trouble that I have caused for myself. <gasps> Remember, and in remembering, look to those things that he has put in place, and let those things be a reminder, because that, when you get a hold of, hey, there's a bird, and you can breathe a sigh of relief. Oh, yeah, God is a provider. He's got it under control. And if you happen to like fish, I happen to like fish, then you can be reminded that God will get you out of certain scrapes. Whenever you see a beast of the field, you can be reminded that, oh yeah, God set this up in such a way that he has orchestrated it. He has shown that he is going to be faithful. Jesus has a lineage. You guys know that, right? Jesus has a lineage. You go to Luke chapter 3. I'm not going to linger on this over long. Luke chapter 3. He follows, uh, Luke does, his, the lineage of Jesus all the way back to Adam. All the way back to Adam. So we can see that all the way from Adam, we had this plan in place already that Jesus was going to come and that he was going to come through this particular lineage. And there it is. Uh, everything comes after its kind. We see that that the beasts of the field and so forth, they come after their kind. There is a point to be brought out of that. And with this, uh, I'm going to close. Go to Matthew chapter 27. And again, with this, I close. So it's worth the wait. Probably. It's probably worth Matthew chapter 27 and go to verse 29. After twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they knelt down before him and mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spat on him and they took the reed and began to beat him on the head. Jesus, if you read the book of John, he was the Word. The Word was in the beginning with God, but he, was, he himself was the God who was in the beginning. He was the creator, and nothing was created that wasn't created by him. This Jesus, if you go back to the book of Genesis again, you see that the fall, that part of the curse was that the ground would produce thorns for you now. 
And those thorns that were produced for Adam and Eve had baby thorns. And they grew up to be big thorns. And then they had baby thorns. And then they grew up to be thorns. And they grew up. And they grew up. And one day, Christ Jesus, the Word who was in the beginning, who had set up from the beginning part of the curse for what it is that you have done, Adam, is that the plants are going to go rogue. The, the earth is going to go rogue. There, there are going to be thorns. And these thorns back here are going to wind up producing a crown, a chaplet that was jabbed down on the head of our Savior. The reeds, the reeds that grew up would produce pollinate, seed, produce more reeds, produce more reeds, produce more reeds, which would be turned into a scepter for our king, which would be snatched away mockingly and beat on the head, Jesus, our king, in mockery, beating on that crown of thorns into his head. God made trees, and in the beginning, the trees were intended to be a blessing. Don't, please, though, don't eat from the fruit of the tree the knowledge of good and evil. Don't do that, says our Lord. And Adam and Eve clutched after their own glory. I can be like God. And they took from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and trees then, from that point and forward, pollinated and grew and pollinated and grew and pollinated until one day somebody rough shod some timbers into the form of a cross. And our Jesus, who designed trees and gave to us wood for things like Noah's Ark, so that the world could be preserved, now gave to us a cross so that now the world could be preserved in its ultimate form, so that you and I could have forgiveness. All the way back here, God made provision in the form of a tree of what would one day become that old rugged cross where our Savior was crucified where our debt as sinners was paid, where our redemption was purchased, where our reconciliation with God was made. Jesus Christ bled and died the death of a rebel. He died the death of a, a rejected uh, a prisoner of, uh, of the Roman state. Uh, he was rejected by his own people in order to be killed mercilessly after being mocked and put on this cross. And this cross then, now, have you guys noticed that uh, a lot of times uh, we, we wind up wearing crosses? <laughs> we wind up, that would be the equivalent of Jackie Onassis wearing a rifle, you know, like a little rifle pendant or something like that. We wear crosses and um, we are reminded that from, from the outset, God made a way. He had in mind from the outset a provision for us. He set things in order, not so that evil would have its way, but so that good would have its way. And Christ paid that price for us on that cross. Now, there are two things that need to be had. One is, if you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, if you have not received forgiveness, if you have not received the reconciliation, look at all that he has done in order to make an appointment with you, that you and he could come together and be reconciled so that you could have forgiveness and provision and reminder of his faithfulness. Be blessed now by receiving this Christ and the forgiveness that he offers. Just call out to him and he will offer you not only forgiveness and blessing, but his very self. But the second thing is, is please be given as a gift a series. Go back to Genesis and read and get for yourself a series of reminders of God's faithfulness. Hey, look, there's a bird. Hey, look, there's a beast of the field. Hey, look, there's a fruit tree. Hey, look, there's a tree that's a deciduous or, you know, hey, look, there's a, 
And there will be reminders everywhere of the provision of God, of the faithfulness of God, of the goodness of God, of how God extends himself in grace and in love and has already prepared the way and is just waiting for you to see it, just waiting to present you with that gift, with that present. The sun, the moon, the stars, the light, food. I mean, Lord's Supper, food, right? I ask of you that you would consider deeply getting into Scripture and finding the encouragements that are here, that are here. Make this year a year of the Word. Make this year a year where you pay close attention and you see what it is that God has done, what it is that He has provided, and then live forward out of God's faithfulness as a source. Know that He will meet you there. Know that He will, he will be good uh, even into the future. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you that we have the ability to remember, to look back, to see your faithfulness. Thank you, God, that in you we have hope. Thank you that you can turn even the most mundane things into a reminder of your faithfulness, that you can show us of your character, you can show us of yourself, your patience, your compassion, your generosity, your love. Help us, Lord, to not let these treasures just sneak by us because we're so busy being nearsighted, so busy being uh, putting our attention on things that really don't matter, seeing things the wrong way around. God, give to us your eyes and your heart and your mind through your spirit. Thank you, God, that you've made a way for forgiveness. Help us to embrace not only being forgiven, but living a forgiven life. Fill us, God, for the sake of this coming year for the sake of your name, 